Hey everyone, I'm Mark Sargent and this is Flat Earth Q&A emails number 15. So let's just get right to it where I read emails that come in to me at msargent23 at comcast.net. If I don't read them on Strange World, you will hear them, he uh, hear them here. So the first email is from Mark Kincaid. Hi Mark, my name is also Mark and I just watched your Flat Earth YouTube video. I texted the number you provided, but I don't know if it gets texts. Maybe a home phone. Uh, let's answer that question real quick. Yeah, don't text me because uh, I don't answer texts. I've never sent a text in my life. I do have a smartphone, but that number is forwarded straight to my PC and the texts do not go anywhere. They just go into space. So, uh, in fact, if I don't even have the phone on while I'm in Canada, the numbers just get forwarded, or the, all the texts and everything get forwarded up here. So, anyway, I figured I would email to make sure you got to see my question. <laughs> Excellent. Please email. Uh, what I said in my text is that a lot of your points make sense to me, but there is something I have a hard time to reconciling. That being, when a boat is approaching a landmass, for instance, an island, the island actually appears to rise up from the water as opposed to being blurry initially and slowly coming into focus as you would expect with a flat earth. Can you explain that experience? Thanks in advance. Uh, yeah, the best, I, I'm, I'm going to defer that question to, well, let's just pick one of the videos that is out there regarding uh, distortion and the vanishing point and refraction, and that is go to the YouTube channel called Jaronism, J-E-R-A-N-I-S-M, and you will see something over the last month, I believe, or you can just look up the flat, you know, Jaronism and then boats, and you will see a wonderful video that he did, I believe it's over an hour long, that goes into great detail about what you see when you're looking over the water and the distortion and how things appear to, you know, it's, it's all an illusion, but you're going you're gonna to enjoy it. So thank you, thank you very much for that, and I, hopefully the Jaron video will help you out. Daniel writes, Vitruvian Man. Uh, hi, Mark. I got to thinking of Leonardo da Vinci in terms of flat earth. As you are probably aware, this guy had a brain which was beyond brilliant. I thought if anyone had the shape of our worldly terrarium figured out back in the day, it was probably Leonardo. Leonardo da Vinci is renowned for using sacred geometry within his paintings. With this in mind, I decided to look at the Vitruvian Man, circa 1490. Lo and behold, look at what is directly above the head of the man in the illustration. Is that a dome or not? And I'm looking at it, and yeah, there's actually a, a really nice shaped dome right above his head and extending just to the tips of his arms. Awesome. Uh, if you choose to consider it a dome, there may be a lot of other deep symbolism within the rest of the illustration. Throughout history, people could be ruined, exiled, or killed if their opinions juxtaposed with that of the ruling classes. Artists and authors had ways of sneaking their opinion in through their work in ways which was not so confrontational, and often did so in an attempt to have a say without losing their head. Now I realize that history tells us public consensus was that we lived on a flat earth prior to the time of Copernicus, therefore making it unnecessary for da Vinci to sneak anything in, but it's likely the shape of our world was a political hot point of contention for years prior to Copernicus. Nicholas Copernicus was most definitely within the upper crust of society and his various family members and ancestors had been amongst the rich and ruling classes for hundreds of years prior to his birth. Oddly enough, Leonardo da Vinci 1452-1519 and Nicholas Copernicus 1473-1543 were near contemporaries. Please send me a brief reply sharing your impression. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, yeah, it's very possible. I, I do think that people over the years have known this, what's going on. But remember, until the invention of the internal combustion engine, what could they really do about it? So yeah, they could portray it in certain things, and I think that's awesome. And maybe it is hidden in artwork and other sacred texts. Uh, but until the internal combustion engine, it's all for naught because you can't do anything. You can't actually physically explore. And that's exactly what they did. As soon as the, that engine got built, then the, as soon as the, the, even the ricketiest uh, aircraft 
started being created then they started you know admiral bird goes up to the north pole in 1926 and then as airplane uh, or uh aviation <coughs> got more and more advanced they they just spent more and more time down in antarctica so awesome thank you thank you for that steve what's steve right i think it's steve uh, Mark, I have followed you since early in September of 2015. You were the main reason I became a flat earther. I love what you do. You have a very reasoned, laid-back style that welcomes everyone while educating us. Thank you. Uh, idea, we flat earthers contribute to a fund until we raise 100 grand or more, then find the seven, I think you said there are seven remaining astronauts that supposedly walked on the moon. Challenge as many are willing to take a lie detector test and end the debate without NASA being phony. They take, take a simple one question lie detector test by a third party. Did you walk on the moon? If seven or as many as take the test fail, the argument about going to the moon is settled as a hoax that rules out all photos from the moon, which is what most people pin their globular faith on. Part of the challenge is we contribute the money to a charity of their choosing, making it hard to say no. If they all refuse to take it, that is paramount to them admitting they would all fail it, right? Thanks, Steve Harris, Chicago, Chicago City, Minnesota. Sh hopefully I spelled that right or pronounced that right. It's C-H-I-S-A-G-O, Chisago City, Chisago City, Minnesota. Um, that's not a bad idea, but honestly, those astronauts are getting so up in age that any of their testimonies at this point are going to be suspect ju just because of age. You know, they weren't they weren't great 20 years ago or 10 years ago. They when when people were talking to them, Bart Sabrell was interviewing them back in 2004. And it was it was that was tough sledding. So I don't know if you're going to be able to pull that off. I think what would be more interesting would be to raise money. You know, you don't have to necessarily raise money for it. Track down the, the freaking Challenger astronauts from 1986. Those people are still around. The six out of the seven people that supposedly died on top of a space shuttle that blew up shortly after liftoff. Find those people. That's That would be the most interesting one because that, take, that kind of is a, a double whammy. You don't. Yeah, it puts the moon missions into question, but it also puts the entire space program into question because they're still walking around. Then has any astronaut ever been put on the t on a top of a rocket going into space? And I don't believe so. So, but I like where your head's at. I like where you're thinking. Again, no idea is a bad idea. It's just it all comes down to logistics. Uh, this one I read on. Patricia's show last night, but I'm going to read it again anyway. This is from Jimmy Chu. I don't think it's his real name. Hey, Mark, I'm kind of broke. LOL. The night owl binoculars are about $500, but the binocular are $200. Do you think can get the job done? No, I do not. I have tested out monoculars, which is just a single lens for one eye. And for night vision, especially if you're looking at stuff in the sky, I absolutely can't cannot endorse any monocular. You need both eyes to, to give you a sense of depth and a great perspective. And the 9L binoculars, yeah, they're about the cheapest. They're about you know, between $400 and $500. You can get more expensive ones, but the, the $500 ones, and you can get them in 5X. If you're going to buy night owl binoculars, and I'm not, I'm, I don't get paid by these guys, then... Uh, don't go for the 3X. I'm actually surprised they don't have more than 5X for, for the price. And that's gen, Generation 1. You, you, know, you can get Generation 1, Generation 2, and Generation 3 night vision. But really, the difference between those is for things close up. So the difference between like Generation 2 and Generation 3 are so that you can see more detail so you don't shoot your best friend when he's sneaking up on you in the dark. That's what that's what generation th and generation three is very very expensive. If anyone's ever <laughs> knows anybody that's military and uh, they have a set of night vision binoculars, ask what kind they are because those suckers are pricey. So yeah, generation one is just fine. Night owl binoculars, but whatever you get, make sure the binoculars not monoculars, and you can get those uh, on Amazon in any day of the week. You don't have to necessarily go to eBay for it. And most of them are made in Russia, which is weird. When you look at it, most of the night vision stuff that I ever test, I've tested quite a few of them. Uh, you know, just got them from Amazon, returned them, got them from Amazon, returned them. They, uh, they're, most of them are made in Belarus. So, uh, let's see. This email is from WW Osha. Tony, Tony Yetzer. Hey, Mark and Patricia. This is written to both of us. Just wanted to let you know that the new vinyl single with the Flat Earth themed You Never Know is now available at eBay. 
although I'd be happy to send you each a copy at no charge. Also, for Patricia, a few were sent to Black Dog Records in the Bel Air section of Houston, so you might be able to pick one up there as well. Anyway, take care, Tony Yetzer. And awesome, Tony, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, if you want to send me a, a, a copy of the vinyl single, absolutely send it to me. All you have to do is email me, msargent23 at comcast.net. I will send you the address in the United States to send it to. Because currently I'm up here in Victoria, Canada, but I do try to get down there often because it's not that far. I mean, you can practically see Woodby Island from the beach down here. And yeah, keep keep everyone that's making songs for Flat Earth. I know it sounds kind of silly, but how many conspiracies do you know are positive, positive enough to where there are songs that are being made? There are 90-something tracks currently in my 2016 Flat Earth music list, and there were not even, well, barely half that last year in 2015. It was like, things, I know that a couple channels dropped off. So there was, I think, maybe, there, there was 50, but now I think there's like 46, 47. But there's over 90 in the ones that are that are in there now in 2016, just 2016. I'll do, I'll start up another one for 2017. Awesome. Love, love the fact that people are making Flat Earth music. And some of the tracks are really, really good, including Grammy-nominated rapper B.O.B., who did a song at the beginning of this year called Flatline. Check that out. That's that's probably the most high-profile one. Really can't get more high-profile than that. Next email. Personalized Plates by Stephen Griffith. Uh, Mark, I first heard you on Coast to Coast. Listening to your explanation of the Flat Earth was like finding the final digit to a vault containing the final puzzle pieces that link the most conspiracy theories together. It really resonated with me. I found your Flat Earth clues and videos that others have posted. Your unique background, calm vocal style, and intelligent way of presenting information makes it easy to listen to you. I purchased a California personalized legacy plate for my red 1989 Corvette. Nice. Uh, and the plate says, and I'll, I'll read it for you here, it's only seven letters, F-I-L-T-A-S-T. -T. And you're thinking, Filtast? That doesn't mean anything. That's not, that's not flat earth or anything. Well, yes, it is. He was very clever about it, and I will now get to the bottom part of his letter. Uh, the attached picture is just a screen capture since I have to wait 8 to 12 weeks for the actual plates. I'm sure you can see what I did with the lettering, it's flat, was taken. So, and I actually didn't know. I, I read your, it would have taken me a while. So I shuffled the letters like a deck of cards. So the first letter is F, every other letter. So uh, every other letter spells out F-L-A-T, and then in the middle, in between, sandwiched is I-T-S. It's a bit subliminal, but so are many of the clues. So the uninitiated future flat earthers, oh, to the uninitiated future flat earthers, once they see it, there's no going back. The other picture is me from my army days, circa 1985. I have something in common with one of your experts. I was a firefinder radar operator, 13 Romeo. I won't claim to be an expert, but I did train on the Q-37 radar. I made the age-old mistake of presenting Flat Earth to a married couple of friends over dinner one night. The wife practically vomited the word bullshit before she caught herself. People, when you visit the zoo, don't jump into the lion enclosure to pet the lions. Wave to them from behind the four-inch ballistic plexiglass. Always test the waters with Flat Earth. I hear they're very cold near the Antarctic. <laughs> ice wall. There's a TV show, USA Network, called Shooter. The main character is a world-class sniper. Two things he said in the first episode made me think, uh, you, Mark. Uh, he came across a couple of weekend warrior hunters and dogged them for using a 223 Remington rifle. He said, the only thing you can kill with this is a squirrel. I know that you are big on the 30 caliber. The other thing he said was about a world-class Russian sniper. He rattled off a few things about a 1,400-meter headshot. Did he use a 50 cal? No. He used a 338 Lapland. Was that a Lapland or Lapal? Uh, Lapal. I think it's Lapal. That's what you're... Uh, he, I think he corrected me later in another email. I'm remembering this one. At 1,400 meters, you would have to factor in the rotation of the Earth. Really? The only time I've ever had to compensate for the rotation of the Earth is when I've had one too many Long Island iced teas. I really enjoy your shows, Mark. Keep your trajectories flat, Steve. And awesome. 
Awesome. Uh, yeah, he's absolutely right on many points there. One, you got to be careful about who you go to when you're talking about Flat Earth. You've got to size up the people. You just can't walk up to them and say Flat Earth. Yeah, you're going to plant the seed regardless, but it's dangerous. You you don't know what their reaction is going to be, and, and you really could put them in a defensive mode right away. The other thing, of course, is that a 223 Remington is an attrition weapon, meaning it was designed, you know, before that, you know, even during the early parts of Vietnam, they were using the 308 Winchester, and which is a 30 cal, a 180 grain, 180 grain bullet. And the the 223 is designed to wound. It is not designed to kill. And people are going, what are you talking about? A 223 can yeah, yeah, 223 can kill, but it's that's not its it's it's not its purpose. Anyone that knows military tactics will know this, and that is how you win a war is you drain resources, meaning a wounded soldier drains far more many resources on the army than a dead soldier. A dead soldier, all you have to do is put him in a body bag and ship him home or bury him wherever. That's it. You know, you don't have the massive amounts of medical expenses and rehabilitation that you've got to deal with. And that's what a 223 does. It wounds. It fires a tiny, tiny bullet. You gotta remember a 22 long rifle, not to go off on a tangent here, a 22 long rifle is only 40 grains. It's a tiny, tiny bullet. 40, 40 grains is not much. The early, I know there's variations of it now, but the early 223, you know, that they were using in the military was only 55 grains. That's tiny. You're saying, well, compared to what? I'm going well compared to a 308, which can go up uh, upwards of 180 grains way bigger way bigger and then like a 45 cal or a, you know that sidearm which they replaced in the 80s that was over 200 grains so anyway that but but this thing about the the the, the fire accounting for the the coriolis effect and rotation of the earth look i've got i've read a statement by a marine corps sniper instructor trained guys for three years it's not in the manual so find me in the manual. Yeah, see, people will mention it from time to time, but they won't use it in practice. It's like, oh, that someone may mention it in a paragraph, but you find me the math that you've got to use and take into account. And then, of course, all the other testimony shows that I've done. Artillery guys, missile guys, torpedo guys, tank guys. They all said the same thing. They're firing way longer than a mile. And none of them are factoring in the spinning of the earth. So anyway, thank you, Steve. Awesome. Thanks for your your, uh, your picture. Thanks for the plates. Uh, great email all around. It's like show and tell. Uh, more Flat Earth Music by Tommy Dyson. Hey, Mark. Ch oh, yeah, yeah. I, I read this, but we'll on another, another show, but I'll read it anyway. For people that have missed it. Hey, Mark, check out the lyrics Fireflies, the song by Owl City. Uh, into the chorus, I'd like to make myself believe that planet Earth turns slowly. It's hard to say. I'd rather stay awake when I'm asleep because everything is never as it seems. What do you think? Thanks, Tom Dyson. Absolutely right. Owl City is a is a great one. Of course, my, my current favorite right now for flat Earth subliminal stuff, look up the uh, 80s band and early 90s band REM. And the, the there's, they had two songs. One was Stand check out that video and look at the lyrics to stand and man on the moon very very interesting and the chorus is there is, is fantastic yeah, i think i read that on a, on a show months and months ago which was you know uh, from man on the moon it was something to the effect i don't have it in front of me that uh, if you believe they put a man on the moon you know the, anyway you gotta go into it so let's see patrick writes Hey, Mark, greetings from a UK D flat earther. There's a simple way to show that we live on a flat plane and to illustrate this, get a length of flexible transparent tube, bend it into a U shape and hold both ends and fill with water so that there is about a foot of air at each end. Now raise one end and while one side of the tube will be lower than the other, the water level will be the same on both sides of the tube. Right now, let's scale it up. The Pacific Ocean has to be a flat plane of water. This joins the Indian Ocean, which is in turn joined to the Atlantic Ocean, add the Southern Ocean, add Antarctica and the Arctic Ocean and the Northern Hemisphere, and one has to have a complete flat body of water upon this Earth. As we know, water cannot curve. It always finds its own natural level. Therefore, our Earth must be flat. It cannot be anything other than flat. Thus, as the oceans all link together, the whole body of the sum of them all has to find its own level. Flat plane it is, curved it isn't. End of debate. The earth is flat. All the best, 
Patrick. Awesome, Patrick. That's, that's super great. Uh, let's see. Sundials. Sundials? Call me. Mark, if you read this on your show, just call me Rick, please. I have a job and I don't want to lose yet. Okay, I don't know your last name, but it's Rick. In fact, your main name may not be Rick. Uh, thank you for the work you do. I really appreciate your demeanor in your videos. It makes the difference. Straight to the point, this thought popped into my head before I found out others had already done some research about it. In a flat earth, sundials should work slightly differently in either hemisphere because in the northern hemisphere, say beyond 40 degrees north, the sun must encircle to some extent a sundial. And the southern hemisphere, say also beyond 40 degrees south, the sun should not encircle but merely approach a sundial. Think of NASCAR, for example, and compare two spectators, one standing inside the track and the other outside where spectators normally sit. Either spectator is going to see the cars going around the track in a slightly different way. The spectator, spe spectator on the inside should get a little more exposure to the cars for a longer period of time. Sundials, therefore, should be configured differently for north and south to tell time accurately. I think all else being equal, sundials for the north should run from about numbers 8 through 4, using just a regular wall clock here for reference, and the sundial for the south should run from about 3 to 9. Does this make sense? I hope it does. I think it should be fairly simple to mount an easy experiment involving willing listeners, one in Melbourne, Australia, and one in San Francisco in the United States. They could print the same printable sundial and see how they behave. Keep it up, Mark. Uh, that's from Rick. Thanks, Rick. It's an, it's an interesting experiment. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, let's see. Flat Earth tune on the radio. Just thought you might be interested to know that the Flat Earth themed You Never Know vinyl single by Felix Zankwar, X A N Q U A R, picked up a spin on K A L X last night on UC Berkeley Radio on 90.7 FM. I'll be releasing a YouTube video with audio from the vinyl in the next few days. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Uh, this one's from Mike. It says, why no GPS over the Southern Hemisphere? Mark, you are the first person I have ever replied to on any social media platform. Believe it or not, I get a lot of emails that start like that. Your video is mind exploding. However, I think I have an answer on the GPS. There are no satellites. There could not be. It has to be a land-based antenna system. As, long, as soon as you go over, go out over water, your, where am I going here? When you, as soon as you go out over water, no serv service estimated. Therefore, flights are kept over land whenever possible to keep the system functioning. This is really blowing my mind. I can find no holes in your videos, but they plug some holes. Have you had time to explore the virtual universe theory being backed by the big names? We may be in the matrix and our universe was programmed by God. I feel excited, slightly alarmed, vindicated, and kicked up my best behavior a notch or two. Thanks and keep it up, Mike. And yeah, um, it, again, you know, we, I, I try to only deal with one world at a time. So we're li if we are living in a matter-based universe and you know we are made of energy, I try not to dig into too much of you know how it could have been created and what machinery you know is God a programmer or are the beings that created this programmers and you know, are we living in like a thirteenth floor matrix type scenario or is it strictly physical like Dark City? Hard to say, really. You know, I'm I'm more curious. You know, we, we can ask those questions when the owners show up, and I I really do think that is coming because the old saying is when the class is ready, the teacher will enter the room, and uh, I really enjoy that saying. Moving on, Mary writes, flat Earth abuse. Hey, Mark, just saw this on my Twitter feed. Here we go again. Which wish they would leave flat earth out of these crazy discussions mary f and they're saying that 52 percent of republicans and there's all these things incorrectly think trump won the popular vote think trump tells the truth think trump is the messiah think god is a republican and the fifth one down is think the world is flat and the last one is think almost always uh yeah interesting interesting so uh, yeah, again, I, I, I don't, it's, it's negative, but at the same time, even bad publicity is good publicity. Every time somebody mentions in the mainstream, the world is flat is going to be tied to our topics. 
So I, I don't, I, I wouldn't shy away from it yet. Uh, this one's from Kelly. Uh, Alvarez, let me start off by saying that you, sir, are completely off your rock. Oh, that's right. I read this. This is going completely off your rocker. And thank God, rocking chairs are fun, but never really get you anywhere. Okay, quick question. So I've seen many renderings of monolithic structures and pyramids laying in some formation across the globe. It is, has it been laid out on a flat map to see if the pattern make more sense? Anyway, keep up the good work. Thanks for being one of the main reasons I woke up uh, Kelly Alvarez out of Florida. And no, I haven't seen the monolithic structures, how they've been laid out. Somebody should do that. Put them, lay them out on, a, on the, the flat map or, you know, the AE map and see how it turns out. But I have, I have not seen that yet. I have, what I have seen, though, is the uh, uh, Ring of Fire. Uh, look in the Chris Pontius model which is uh, when you take the ring of fire, the Pacific Rim, all the volcano chains around the Pacific Rim, and you put it on the, the A map, it becomes a line of fire, right down, almost right down the middle to where it divides the, uh, the world in half. And I thought that was very fascinating. Uh, let's see, this one's from Melody. And Melody just happened to mention, she said that, oh yeah, by the way, just so you know, the Earth is Flat domain name was taken just recently. So three weeks ago, I probably mentioned to you guys that the, you know, you can go to GoDaddy and pick up a domain name for cheap, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, uh, 50 bucks is an expensive do domain name. But Earth is Flat, because it's trending so heavily, was going for about $20,000, $25,000 American. And that's a chunk of change for a domain name, just one domain name. And what was more interesting was within the last three weeks, somebody bought it. I absolutely know that it's nobody in, in, in the current Flat Earth community, the public Flat Earth community, we would have heard about it by now because that, that's, a, that's again, that's quite a bit of money. And love to know who did it. You know, was it another domain service that thought it was going to trend? And so did somebody else buy it? Then maybe they're going to resell it. I don't know. But it's very, very interesting that, uh, that it was picked up. So thank you for that, Melanie. Steve writes, Hey, yes, Sarge. I've been using hashtag it's flat on multiplayer games as my handle. It gets about a 60-40 reaction from the gaming public, which is surprising to me. 60% make fun of it or try to act like they know Neil deGrasse Tyson personally. But almost half uh, either don't see anything or ask about it. This reminds me of the 2016 election. We know that many millions of voters were closeted Trump supporters the way the election night happened. This is good news. Younger people are opening their minds to it. The only single problem in this entire movement is NASA and the exploration of space. I think the political drama that occurred this year echoes this. We've already seen the political system is full of lies and deception. Of course, a singular organization like NASA could lie as well. You can see how the majority of mankind already accepts that we are a completely random life form in a mind-blowing endless universe that rotates around the sun. It cannot be very hard to be compartmentalized at NASA and not be aware of the absolute truth. Why would you even question anything? Anyway, I just want to say hello. I'm still listening to your recorded shows. I would love to call in sometime but I want to have something prepared so it doesn't end up like that 15-year-old Budweiser commercial. What's up? Steve Cordero. So thank you, Steve, very, very much. And yeah, I, I think you get a point there. I think there's a lot of closet people. Not, not to you know, make a direct comparison to like say uh, something else in the closet like homosexuality, but census takers will tell you that there's only a 5% homosexual population in the United States or industrialized countries. But we all know that it's more like 10%. And, you you know, see, talk, to, think about how many people you know and how many of them are gay. And it's because the other 50% of them are in the closet, hence the term in the closet. You know, they want to they wanna live normal lives. They want to get married. They want to have kids. They want the best of both worlds, if all possible. Why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't they? And... I think that's the same with a lot of things. The the Trump stuff. Yeah, people secretly voted for, well, or some not voted secretly for Trump. Or Flat Earth. I think there's I think there's probably millions of Flat Earthers right now. The way this thing is spread, mostly because of the retention rate. Remember, it's a 99.9% .9 retention rate. If you look into this, if you look inside Pandora's box, you're going to end up 
uh, a flat earther. Now, what type of flat earther? You know, infinite plane, enclosed world, multiple domes. We don't know. But you're definitely going to be away from the globe. And so, yeah, I think there's a ton of people that are into flat earth. The, the only reason it hasn't gotten more uh, public and more mainstream is because mainstream is very, very resistant to it. Extremely resistant because science has a big place in mainstream media. So, yeah, thank you for the email. That's awesome. Uh, let's see here. Moving on. This one's called Aldrin. Hey, Mark, I've been enjoying your videos. I did find a news item that I did not want you to miss. I'm sure you haven't. Here is the link. Buzz Aldrin South Pole Evacuation. Yeah, it's on timemagazine.com. Uh, my immediate thoughts are that Buzz Aldrin in his twilight years actually wanted to go see for himself what prevented him from actually going to the moon. Yeah, that's a great one, actually. That's a, that's a good storyline. I have to admit, I am still somewhat of a skeptic of a flat earth, but seeing an 86-year-old Aldrin in the Antarctic for no particular reason has really opened my eyes. Take care, Christopher Kiever from Tennessee. Yep, totally on board with you there, Christopher. David writes, greetings from Texas. Oh, I'm going to use this screenshot, by the way. Uh, recently, Google used a domed structure, and I will use that as probably the next Strange World uh, episode thumbnail. So for, thanks, for Chris, for sending it, and I will use it. But he goes, before you get started, I wrote this over a couple hours while multitasking, having a sinus infection causing, looking at the screen, to hurt my eyes. And it being 4 to 6 a.m. while writing it, unable to sleep, being ill, I'll apologize in advance for my grammar. Oh, you're good so far. I want to say three things. First, two are flat earth related, with the third being something I thought you might find amusing. If you haven't looked at the attachment yet, wait until you read the last paragraph of the letter, which will set it up. Uh, <laughs> nice. A, I think you're doing a good thing publicly discussing the flat earth. I am certain you undoubtedly receive far more ridicule than you mention on air which is the reason for many of the prayers sent up on your behalf. Uh, to respond to that, actually, no, I don't. I, yeah, I get a lot of comments, but I don't really read comments in YouTube deliber deliberately because I, I have an ego. The emails that I get and the phone calls I get are 99.9% .9 positive because trolls like to remain anonymous. You do not want to call me with your phone number and start giving me crap. With that being said, there are people that call me up drunk. But, but they just don't know any better. And the emails, same sort of thing. You're going to spoof an email if you're a troll. Trolls are lazy. They do not want to go out of their way. They literally are lazy. I challenge any trolls out there listening. It's like, hey, don't be lazy. Send me a troll email. Maybe I'll read it. Uh, so he goes from A to 2. Well, I think that's funny. I wanted to point out a very commonly used scripture that I am fully aware of. Uh, its meaning is metaphorical and not a literal illustration of something straight above us, yet I haven't heard it mentioned anywhere in a Flat Earth video. But of course, I have not seen every video. This something I'm referring to is the line repeated many times in my favorite book of the Bible, Ecclesiastes. It says, there is nothing new under the sun. I use that line all the time, actually. Uh, luckily, NASA did not exist in Solomon's days, or that passage might have read, there's nothing new under the sun. Come back in 12 hours when the sun's under us and everything's new. <laughs> nice. And then it goes from A to 2 to D. Okay, attaches a screenshot I took when I first began looking into conspiracy theory topics before I even knew where to begin. It was 3 in the morning, and I had already watched several documentaries that had me in a full-on tin hat mindset. So when I entered the search words into Google and the return was something I have never seen before or since, I found it quite amusing. Hopefully you will as well. Enjoy David Nelson. And I will uh, make that screenshot. In fact, maybe I'll include it in the slideshow uh, for this as well. But I'll make that the uh, thumbnail for the new Strange World episode for next week, which will be the last one of 2016. Moving on, Jeffrey writes, hello. He wrote this to Jaron as well. Hello, Jaronism and Mark. I had a thought today, which I guess you both already have thought of, but just to be sure I wanted to share. In a globe model, the Earth is freely floating in space, with space and stars being all around it, up and down 360 degrees as far as the eye can see. If one is standing on the top of the Earth, they would look up at the night sky and see the stars above them. However, if one were standing on the bottom of the Earth, upside down from the person at the top's perspective, they would look up at the night sky and would see the stars directly below Earth, and they would be a completely different set of stars and constellations as seen from the top of the Earth. If the Earth is flat, the sky and the stars are above us. So that makes me wonder, what is below us? Water? Just my thought. Am I correct in my thinking? Enjoy your day, guys. 
Jeffrey from Oregon. And yeah, Jeffrey, we don't know what's below us. I mean, got to remember, we can't even drill down further than eight miles, which I think is very suspicious. Again, I try to live one world at a time. I, do I think we are God's footstool? Yes. Do I think we are sort of a snow globe type scenario? Yes. What is outside of said footstool or snow globe? I don't know. Matt Boyle will say it's it's a it's an infinite plane. Do I think it's more worlds like this? Yeah, I think it's very possible. I don't think this is a one-off. So, but the big thing is you you've got to again. It's tough because we're all reinforced with this since we were small children. And that is. Who told you there was space to begin with? Who told you that what you see in the sky was an endless universe? We are so programmed to think that there's space out there. You know, I love the, the drawings and illustrations that it's a flat earth floating in space. And you don't get it. If it is a flat earth, especially if it's got a dome structure, then it could be anything outside that dome structure. You don't have to uh, have real space out there. It, it, you're, you, that means space is being simulated. No different than a planetarium. If you're inside a planetarium, you're looking up at space that's in the planetarium, what's outside the planetarium? Well, you don't know because you're you're just looking, you, you have no idea. So, but it's a it's a great thing, you know, a great thought experiment. I encourage everyone to at least go down that road once. Moving on, this one's from Jonathan. Hi, Mark, third time emailing you. God bless and thank you for your work. I just wanted to, you to know how I came across something interesting. I listened to your interview with Rob Skiba discussing Kent Hovind and the literal Bible. Strangely, in 2015, Kent Hovind made a new seminar called The Coming Judgment. This is shortly after he was released from prison. In the beginning, when he got emotional, he started crying as soon as he went to the podium. Shortly after walking up to the podium, he stated, I believe the Bible is the literal infallible word of God. Now, the weird part is this. The two videos of this seminar have removed this part f from the video when he dis when he's discussing the literal and infallible Bible. It's no longer there. Anyone who goes on YouTube, type in Seminar 2015 Coming Judgment Kent Hovind. You can see where they cut it. I find it interesting they would delete that part where he's speaking about a literal Bible. So are the Kent Hovind people now, do they now want him to veer from the literal because of this whole flat earth thing? Just the conspiracy nutter in me, I guess. Thanks again for reading John from Ohio. Yeah, why not? Why, 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 why not have him pull away from it? Because if it is, you know, if he can't be literal and not literal. Again, if you want to look at the, the Christian side of things, go to Rob Skiba's, because he mentioned here in the email, Rob Skiba's website, which is called testing, um, testingtheglobe.com. So testingtheglobe.com, you will find every chapter in verse. And yeah, yeah the Bible is, is really leans heavily on the flat side. Uh, this one's from Travis. Travis. Hi, Mark. First one to say awesome job with what you are doing. I've been listening for a few months. I've seen a lot of your stuff as well as Eric Dubé. And I love the Globebusters good show yesterday. I'm 99% there, but just have that last mental block for flat Earth. I think the most convincing observations are the four moving vectors, rotations of Earth, revolutions around the sun, revolutions of the galaxy, and the expanding universe, yet no one feels any motion. My question is, why do you think others in the community don't use the planetarium argument? It appears to be the easiest explanation of anything in space. The four movements would necessitate that stars and constellations would constantly change position over time. And what he's talking about there is parallax. Look that up. Parallax scrolling. We, we use that in games all the time. And that is when you're like the easiest example is if you're driving in a car, the telephone poles next to you or mailboxes go by really fast. But the mountains in the distance move very slow because the distance between the, 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 um, the telephone poles and the mountains is quite a ways compared to the car. You, if you're talking about stars, you've got some stars that are less than 10 light years away and others that are thousands, if not millions of light years away. So over hundreds of years, if not thousands, those constellations in the sky should change eventually because you, we're, we're traveling through space. The, the solar system's traveling and the galaxy's traveling. So if that's happening, what uh what you know we, shouldn't we be seeing this and we're we're not and you know science the the only argument science can come back there with is that the distances are so great and we just haven't been on earth long enough to see them and if we lived thousands of years longer if our civilization then we would see them it's tall order i'm not buying it 
Uh, anyway, last question. Have you looked into Anthony Patch about CERN and the LHC, oh, the Large Hadron Collider? Collider. Uh, no, I haven't really. I mean I, I mean, I know of it, but I haven't spent too much time in it. Interesting hypothesis, uh, hypothesis, but it's tough to discern if it's completely wacko or he's on to something. Anywho, I work at Harvard University in IT and take graduate classes there as well. I'll be probing my physics and astronomy professors with a few questions this coming semester, but I'll be following rule number one, don't talk about flat earth. Actually, it's don't talk about flat club. But yeah, I know what you mean. I'll let you know what they say without the, he signs it, without the spin, Travis. Awesome, Travis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Pontius building his stuff. I've got to download those, those pictures. This one's from Hakob, J-A-K-O-B-R-I-T-S-E-M-A. Hello, Mark. What do you think is the square meters of the flat earth? I think when you unfold the globe, it is much bigger than they told us. What do you think is the length in meters or kilometers when you make a circle from the South Pole around? With great regards, Jakob Ritzima from Leek in the Netherlands. Uh, I, I can't give you kilometers, but it, what was the estimate? Other people have done this. I think it's at least, what, 50,000 miles around, 60,000 miles around the outer edge, which sounds about right. Which makes, of course, the Antarctic coastline very, the only thing very, very different from, in fact, unrecognizable from what they tell us from the Mercator map or the Gall Peters map. So, I don't know, 50,000, 60,000 miles, roughly, I think. So, and, and if you're asking me what the square meters of the, I hope that's the question he's asking. I think it is. What do you think is the length in meters when you make a circle from the South Pole around? So, hopefully, he listens to that one. Laura writes, hello, Mark. No, so I'm sorry. Oh, she doesn't want me to use her real name. <laughs> nice. I right, we're going to call her Laura. Hello, Mark. I came uh, across the video Hiding God and watched it immediately. I actually called you after the rest button comment. The video is brilliant in the delivery, both verbal and visual. Every aspect resonated with me and the clue statement of our imagination was one of those electric moments that not only resonated but actually vibrated from within me Ooh, well and i think she's talking about the uh clue eight the creative force which i still i i love more than most even though it's not really a flat earth clue i i thought it was more of an inspirational thing but it was very uh, i enjoyed it do you have any thoughts and opinions on ascension hermetic philosophy the universal laws consciousness sacred geometry theory of one in addition to the spiritual i have sifted through some of the scientific like quantum mechanics semitics electricity living water and the junk dna and then mythology and prophecy of gods aliens superheroes ant people i'd love to talk to you about, about some of these things and then she signs it uh, i don't know this word uh m-i-t-a-k-u-y-e space O-Y-A-S-I-N exclamation point. And she signs it daily. The, uh, yeah, I've thought about all that stuff. Of course, you know, you can't, you can't think about flat earth with, without thinking about spirituality. And it has been an interesting journey for me because I've fallen, I fell away from spirituality for a number of years. Uh, being more science oriented, I think, than anything else. Uh, you know, I didn't get a degree in, in any sort of ology, which is tied to mainstream science, but I was a big science fiction fan and science fan for that matter, and trying to work out science into science fiction. You know, I loved how Star Trek was influencing uh, mainstream science and how uh, mainstream science was then influencing other creative outlets. And I thought there was, it was some, some symbiotic relationships there between science and the entertainment industry. Um, but when it comes to, you know, all those things you mentioned there, yes, I've given it some thought, I, you know, we'll probably correspond one-on-one -on -one for that. So if you, if you want try to be more specific about a few things there, cause there's too, too many things you listed off and I'll, I'll see what I can do for you. Moving on. Ishmael writes mark i know you get a lot of emails from wherever and whoever i live in castle rock colorado and i started meditating on gaining understanding and wisdom and vowed to keep an open mind which you have blown i'm no freak i own my own business for 15 years grew up in an esoteric teachings uh 50 years old and feel uh, i am going through a transition it's hard for me to even watch television anymore because i feel it's all a lie every day 
I would love to have coffee. My cell is fill in the blank here. Please leave a message if you call. I don't answer numbers I don't know. Hey, you and me both. And this is from Ishmael Buckley. And yeah, man, I, I a couple of years ago, absolutely. But I, even though I was in Colorado and my, the phone number when you call in my 303 area code and then my 720 area code are both Colorado numbers, are both, um, uh, they're both being forwarded here. And so I'm, I'm currently up in the Northwest and I s split my time between uh, my family, which is down in the Seattle area, and my girlfriend, which is up in Victoria, Canada, which is just west of Vancouver. So, sorry, I, I'd love to have coffee with you, but you're in Colorado now, and, and I would have, and I did, when I was out there, when this flatter thing happened, I met with several people for lunch and or coffee when I was out in Colorado, and it's, it's really, really great. So, it, you know, love meeting the people, which is why we had the mixer. Moving on. This is from this. I read this. Uh, I read this. I read this song. Uh, John O'Reilly. Um, if if he's listening to this, I I actually read that on Patricia Steer's show. So I'm not going to read it again. I don't want to. I, I I think it was more of a one-off. So thank you, thank you, for writing me that song. And uh, it wasn't for me exactly, but it was it was about hope and 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 I thought that was really really good. Uh, let's see, Scott. We can do a few more. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I did an interview on um, on Underground Resistance Radio, and he was just saying it was it was really great, and uh, it went it went well. So thank you for that, and I'll have to respond to him separately. Peter Gibbons writes, "Hello, I've enjoyed your vids. Glad to know people are maybe waking up. Here's the thing: you're probably." into other topics. So Ghostbusters 2, uh, when we were first introduced to Janusz, the creepy dude, with Dana at the art gallery scene, glass beaker containing cotton swabs that Dana is using. When the camera l lingers over the beaker, what do you see in the beaker? Honestly, I'm not crazy, but then again, I've been a flat earther all my life. Normal folks probably tend to disagree. Uh, thank you for Peter Gibbons for writing that. Of course, he doesn't, I don't have Ghostbusters 2 on this machine. Somebody look up Ghostbusters 2 and tell me what you see in the beaker when when you're in there. I, I, I know Ghostbusters 2 isn't nearly as good as Ghostbusters 1. And they took too long to make the sequel. But I, I'd like to know, because he never tells me in this email. He just says, oh, look in the beaker, you'll see something. It's like, okay. I know he's, he's keeping me in suspense, so thanks there for that. Uh, hey, Mark, I would like to purchase your book. This is from Jimmy Choo. And can you sign it for me, please? What is the step-by-step -step process? <sighs> All right, if you want me to sign um, your book, and I'll write him here in a little bit, uh, you're going to have to go to Amazon, buy the book, ship it to me from Amazon. That, you know, don't, don't ship it to your house and then mail it to me. Ship it to me, and then uh, I will... Uh, we'll make arrangements, but I'll I'll sign it and then ship it to you. You'll have to pay for shipping, of course, but I will uh, I'll be happy to do that for you. So thank you, Jimmy Choo, for that, or whatever your real name is. Uh, let's see here. This one's from we don't know. I don't know who this is. I, it's it's anonymous. Uh, hey, Mark, my eyes have been open for the last six months. Now I focus most of my energy on figuring out what to do with it. Thanks you for your efforts. It is highly likely that you have come across the below material, but just in case, it may be a great open discussion forum or posting for your channels regarding why the scientific community ignores their own rules and how little sense it actually makes. A true scientist and a truther, though he may not be yet engaged in the flat earth. He attempted to point out how both gravity and the speed of light have been documented as being irregular, not constant, and was given some very interesting responses from those in authority in those fields. He challenges their process at their own game, and it doesn't go over well for them. And it's called Banned TED Talk on the Science Delusion. That's on YouTube. Uh, and there's also another one called Interview by Ske Skeptico, S-K-E-P-T-I-C-O, regarding the TEDx ban. Uh, P.S. Thank you for the no hate message since I have delved far into the rabbit hole and I'm personally dismayed watching the culture in the flat earth community grow from brave and inquisitive to childlike argumentative insulting and frankly some of them uh, would have could out would have could out do a McCarthy uh, McCarthy dogma speech proud oh, would have done yeah. spell checker guys got to read your emails before you send them. 
if we want to reach young people, specifically millennials, we need to keep emotion, name calling, and frankly, all rhetoric beyond observable proof or ancient reference text to ourselves. You carry on quite well as a professional and an informed and concerned citizen of this plane, and it shows in the effectiveness of your conversion rate. Thank you. I am never afraid to refer someone to your channels. Uh, thank you, whoever whoever wrote that. I do not have a name for you. I'm not going to read your emails, or not going to read your email address. Uh, let's see here. How many do I have left? How much time do I got left? Uh, nine minutes. Let's do this one. Hey, this one's from Gene. Hey, Mark. My name is Jeff. My name is Jeff from Florida. I've been watching one of your videos right now. It talks about the world is flat. I was just wondering if you got more evidence because I think it's flat also, but I need more proof of that. If you got more info about it, please feel free to email me back. Thank you. And uh, yeah, when I get emails like this, I know that they're going to be digging in further. So I don't generally respond to them because if they, if they it's people, a lot of people email me if they're only like clue two or three, and then they just keep going. And as you know, anyone that goes into flat earth loses a whole bunch of sleep right off the bat and they don't know what to do. Uh, this one's from Krishnadas. Hey Mark, I've been watching your videos. They are hiding God with the greatest lie ever. Could you recommend any books that would elaborate on flat earth? Uh, yeah, yeah, I could. Uh, the 200 Proofs by Eric Dubay, that's always a good one. Flat Earth Clues, which is a nice little follow-up to They Are Hiding God with the Greatest Lie Ever. Um, there's several people that have written books out there, but you're going to find much, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. You're going to find much more info on the YouTube vids right away. And I think, again, I'm not going to respond to him. I'm, you know, if, he, if he's listening to this, he already knows by now that you know, all you have to do is type in Flat Earth into YouTube and you will find a, just a wall of information. The video string that I try to send people to right now is called my Flat Earth Shortlist. It's on my channel. It's for newbies. And you can, see, you can give it to anybody. And there's videos from five minutes long to two hours long. And I think it starts out with Marty Leeds, the Flat Earth Litmus Test, the Ultimate Flat Earth Litmus Test. And I consider that probably one of the, the greatest introductions to Flat Earth. And, uh, yeah. So that's what I do for that guy. Oh, yeah. And they are hiding God with the greatest lie ever. That's one of the mirrors. That's not even... Yes, it's my clues, but because I didn't put all my clues, you know, they're in short segments. Because remember, when I started off doing the YouTube vids, I could only make videos that were less than 15 minutes long. So that's one of the reasons why the clues were broken up into sections. And then people, you know, mashed them up. And, and because it was Creative Commons license, they put them on their own channels. So there's a couple videos out there that are basically the Flat Earth Clues that have a couple million hits. And that's the, the probably the biggest one, They Are Hiding God with the Greatest Lie Ever, which is a variation of one of my clues, which was titled They Are Hiding God. So thank you for making that and, and whoever distributed it. Let's do a few more. Daniel Wiley says, Hey, Mark, uh, the more I think about Flat Earth, the more convinced I am that the curvature in all directions would be plainly apparent. With this in mind, I got to thinking about computer models. I know almost nothing about computer models other than they exist and the people use them to, for various applications in science. That being said, there are experts in computer models who might be willing to do a little work in order to provide a comparative demonstration. What if a computer model was created which shows the visual perspective from a cockpit of a plane flying over Manhattan at 5,000 feet on a flat surface as compared to a plane flying over Manhattan at 5,000 feet on a perfect, perfectly spherical globe with a circumference of 24,901 miles? I have 100% confidence that the perspectives from each model would appear radically different. Is this too tall of an order or not? Thanks, Daniel. Uh, no, it's not a bad idea, and but there's already computer models that, that are out there. There's one, most notably, that's uh, with a striped balloon that rises above, uh, a, a, not necessarily a crude model, but it's not super detailed. 5,000 feet, by the way, is not going to be high enough. I, I will agree with Neil deGrasse Tyson on this point, and that is even at 100, uh, well, yeah, you should be able to see the curve when you get up at a, to a certain altitude, but you just got to be way higher than 5,000 feet. And remember, it's not the side by, it's not the left to right curvature that, that really should convince people. It's the forward and back. It's looking over the hill in front of you, which means the curvature should be, you know, at, if the curvature is eight inches per mile squared, then at 100 miles, it's, you know, a little less than 7,000 feet. So at 100 miles, you shouldn't be able to see any object that's really less than 7,000 feet in um, elevation. And we do all the time. Look at the, the, the there's tons of examples. The, the best one's out in Hawaii, where you can see islands that are way, way far away. And you can see the entire island. 
and these islands are not that high. So uh, I, I like where your head's at. You're not quite there on the math yet, but that's fine. Uh, again, love love that you're you're thinking about it. Uh, can we do one more? Yeah, let's do one more. And uh, hi, Mark Oliver from Germany. I like your video. And he click mentions one of my flat Earth clues. Would you believe the sun to be flat? And what about the other planets such as Mars? Are they flat too? Uh, and what about the images taken from Mars? Thank you for your answers. Best regards, Oliver Lindemann from Hilden, Germany. And yeah, I, I won't end on this one. I'll do one more. Which is, uh, I, if I consider this world to be a planetarium and anything in the sky is not necessarily flat, I mean, it could be a spherical hologram for all we know, but it is, um, you're, you're not, you're not quite there yet. You're not thinking too, you're not, you're not using your, your imagination and perspective too much yet to try to break out of, uh, out of this matrix you're, you're thinking. And the, the big part here is that, um, uh, when you're thinking, oh, you know, the pictures, what about the images taken from Mars? You're assuming you can get to Mars and I'm saying, no, 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 you're limited that the sky ends. It's no different than a planetarium. Can you land on Mars inside a planetarium? You say, well, no, it's an image. I'm going, okay, what's the difference between that and where we are right now? I'm saying that when you walk out of the planetarium, you're at a bigger planetarium. You're not landing on anything. You're not landing on, on Mars. You're not landing on the moon. You're not even going nearly high enough to land on anything. You got to break away from space. Who told you there was space? That's what it really boils down to. Who told you? Who gives you all the images from space? Who reinforces space constantly? The United States government. They're the ones that started it. Yes, there are other space agencies, but they're all blueprinted from the United States government. Uh, 57, let's do one more. One more. Oh yeah, I gotta find a good one. Uh, nope, I don't wanna do one with math. I wanna do... Uh, nope, don't want to do that one. Oh, come on, there's got to be one I can do that's, uh, that's be kind of interesting. Um, okay, okay, let's do this one. Uh, the beginning of the flat plane. It's a perfect way to end this. Hello, Mark, I've been thinking and thinking. Really can't do anything more but think about flat earth and the dumbed down society. This plane in the beginning was nothing more than a flat infinite ice sheet with the sun going round and round. Could it be that the sun going between the tropics melted the ice first, giving the oceans and exposing a little land? This could be why there are hidden cities under the oceans to this day. The sun continues to melt the ice cap, raising the sea level making the ancient cities disappear. I love to figure out problems, but this big question of who, what, where, when, why has been killing me. I became a flat earther October of 2015 after looking at YouTube for the first time and seeing everything about planet Nibiru scared the crap out of me. Then there was the flat earth videos that just like you kept passing them up. First video and I couldn't put my phone down. Thanks for your dedication, along with all the other Globebusters, uh, ODD, Eric Dubé, and more. Thank you, Lenny. P.S. I live in Connecticut and have been on the water all my life. Long Island is a great view over the curve. Haha. <laughs> happy holidays. And with that, uh, happy holidays to everyone there as well. Thank you for writing in. Again, you can email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net. And uh, hopefully we will do a Q&A next week, which would be the last one for 2016. Uh, if not, then this one will be the last one for 2016. But either way, uh, peace on Earth. And by that, I mean flat Earth. See you next time, guys.